the first thing I'm going to have you do is stand up. Stand up, come on. Use those feet of yours. All right, and here's where we're going to start with is I just want you to just uh, hands up and yawn. Oh, okay, lean over to your left or your right. It doesn't matter. Very good. And yawn again. Oh, that's right. I am going to my right, so if I said left, it's not good. Okay, and it's like yawn. Oh. Okay, and the next thing we're going to do, very important, is get friendly with your neighbor. Um, so turn to your right and left, say hi. I encourage you not to shake hands. How will you slap a high five? Well, well done. Okay, so now we're going to play a game that we all remember from when we were a child, and that's lava. And on the outside, there's lava, so move in. There's lava on the outside. Don't touch it and move in. Get close. Come on. This is good. This is going to be fun. Come on. All right. Very good. Now, while you're, while you're doing that, um, I'll introduce who I am. So my name is Adam Covey. Uh, I am a member of a company called Zeal. We are a consultancy. Uh, we specialize in a handful of things, but the stuff I want to be known for ultimately is an amazing experience. So my job here today is to do exactly that. Give you guys an amazing experience. And you're going to be the judgment, and I'm perfectly accepting of that. But the best way for you to show me whether or not you're actually out there and ready to engage is I want you to go, woo! Woo! Very good. The other one is if you've ever heard of a power five, right? Okay? And it goes something like this, and one. Okay? And one. Very good, right? Also known as a power five, you might have heard that before. So this is entirely meant to be a very interactive experience, right? Now, if you remember, it's like way old. Maybe you don't. None of you remember. Um, but way back in the day, talking four, five, six hundred years ago, um, any of you remember? Just out of curiosity. Uh, no? Okay, so uh, if, you, if, if you remember. Yeah, okay. So way back in the day, way back in the day, um, especially like in the theater, the Globe in London. Um, there was, uh, the, the very center of it was filled with the groundlings, and the groundlings were like the very cheap seats, right? But here's what's cool about the cheap seats back then is they were totally interactive, right? It was expected that you react and engage, right? That's the beauty of live theater. If it was anything other than that, then guess what? You'd have what we now call TV, right? <laughs> so that's the beauty of this, is this is meant to be engaging and interactive. Fight the urge to dive into that technology for just a moment, okay? And really, just have a good time. That's all I'm going to ask. Now, again, I'm going to tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, this is me. This is my serious face. Um, it's the only time you've seen it. And if you ever see my serious face, uh, I mean, uh, I'm actually joking. Okay? <laughs> uh, I'm also an actor. Uh, I've worked professionally for a good amount of years before I was in software. And even during software, I found a really struck a really awesome balance um, between the two. Uh, this is a two-person show I did where there were 16 characters, and I played 15 of 16 characters. <laughs> um, ranging anywhere from a 10-year-old boy to a 10-year-old girl to the grandparents. Um, so very, very, very fun. It was called Mrs. Manderley. Um, this is when I played Don Lockwood in Singing in the Rain, where literally on the last night, the beauty of live theater, it literally rained because it was an outdoor theater. <laughs> right? So when I say, I'm singing in the rain, everybody applauded. Just like this. <laughs> and then one of the most favorite shows I did, I am the one, third over from the left, second over from the right, I put the cowardly lion. And there are a few people in this audience that actually actually saw this show. Um, this was also in an outdoor theater. I was wearing head to toe, not only makeup, but a full polyester costume, and it was in the middle of the summer. I just about sweat to death, but I'll tell you this, that it's an amazing thing what, uh, what the energy of an audience will give you. It's an amazing, amazing thing. So, this is another reminder that you feed this presentation more than anything else. And I want to make that really clear. Every single one of you. Your level, level of engagement is critical to live theater. It's absolutely critical. And I'm going to show, remember from over here to over here, how what we can divide in the middle is a, is a type of interaction, a type of perspective on, uh, on software development that is very fulfilling, right? That we get more of ourselves than we could ever did before, right? That's the beauty of what we do. And I'm going to talk about a, a handful of different things. Oh, God, sorry, for those of you, I am married, but uh, I do like to read. Um, and then I'm also a Lebanon. 
<laughs> so in case you're, I just wanted to clear the air. Um, and then last but not least, you can find me on both GitHub and Twitter. Uh, I'm a very approachable guy, I hope you know that. Um, so I absolutely love to engage. There's no question you can't ask me. Um, pretty much just about, I'll answer just about anything. And it's because I absolutely fundamentally believe that if I can help you in some way, shape, or form, um, then I've done my job. Um, and the last thing I'm gonna do is the purpose of this, and this is the goal. Um, very recently, um, I, I decided to kind of create a very abstract, but very simple model to live by. And, and I would encourage everybody here to do this exact same thing. And my model that I chose was something that, you know, I can define for myself, but also is very altruistic and is very giving. And I decided to pick this, Amplified Greatness. Now, the reason why I'm telling you about this today and for this purpose is to illustrate one purpose and goal that I have for today, and that is, you are great. You are sitting here because you have something very, very valuable to give. You are great. If you're junior, senior, or anything in between, you are great. So my responsibility here in this presentation is one simple thing. Amplify that. Make it a little bit better, right? Help you start fine. Okay, so now we're through that stuff. Okay? Now let's get to the fun things. Because um, the other stuff is so boring. <laughs> Alright, um, last year anybody see that announce? Right? So DHH during his keynote last year uh, made this claim is that ultimately we're, uh, I'm going to butcher it a little bit, but kind of, kind of summarizing the touch, and that is that we are software writers, right? Um, and, and this was something that I think caught a lot of people off guard. Some people were like vehemently against it. Like, no, I'm not a software writer, I'm, a, I'm an engineer, right? I'm, I'm, a, I'm not just that, that petty, right? And I think ultimately, the reason why, and I got this from just the basic Google dictionary, which is totally accurate, um, is that, you know, if you look through this, if you look through some of the words, um, ultimately it boils down to just like trade skills, right? Like uh, just things that you do, just simple activities, one plus one equals two, stuff like that. You know, and it's like, you know, it, it boils down to just kind of this simple stuff. You know, I for E except F for C. For those of you who are not familiar with English entirely, this is kind of a convention that's using the English language that's totally jacked up. Um, <laughs> but, you know, it's similar to that. It's just like, you know, we're meant to just put dots together, right? And I think that the reason that there was such an emotional reaction to it was because it just, it felt like it just lacked purpose and meaning, right? I was like, you know, I, I want to do something that really matters, you know? And I came up with this realization, and that is that language is powerful. It's very, very, very powerful. It has a lot of meaning in our lives. The words I use and how I use them for you and you to other people has a lot of influence, right? And so the notion of being just a software writer was just like, you know, that's not enough, right? I mean, the reality is, is that we're talking about something that's very brilliant. I mean, think about this just for a second. We're talking about Ruby, right? And what is a Ruby? A Ruby is brilliant, right? And so there's something about that that really has value. That's something that, like, I think speaks to a lot of us, even if we're like, yeah, yeah, that a Mooney too, right? And I think that's very, very real. So coming back to the software writers, you know, I wanted to focus here on, on writers. And, and, and I really was like, you know what? I just wanted to be sexy. <laughs> I mean, that's all I want in my life. I just want this to be sexy. You know, and so looking back at writer, I noticed that if you kind of expand, there's a synonym, synonym in there that was poet. And I was like, poet. Yeah. Oh, that's sexy. I like poet. And I was like, okay, well, what does that mean? And I looked in here and I was like, oh, poet, that seems simple. And then I noticed this little gem down at the bottom. Special powers of imagination and expression. I want special mother effing powers. That's what we're talking about. So I'm like, I am a poet. That's it right there. I'm a poet. Language has meaning, and I'm a poet, right? I have special powers of imagination and shit. Like, I mean, I have I mean, this is a beautiful thing. You know, so, you know, the natural question is, well, so how can I be, uh, you know, fucking poet with magic powers, right? I mean, like, how can I be this thing? You know, and so it's like, okay, let's, let's start from the beginning, right? And let's ask ourselves a really kind of core and fundamental question, and that is, well, who exemplifies the things I want to be, right? And I was like, well, there's a lot of models out there, and I think that there's a lot of times that we're going to see, especially during this conference, that we're going to meet uh, you know, some celebrities in our trade, right, in our craft, that are really kind of like, they represent who we want to be, and that's a beautiful and wonderful thing. And I realized that as an actor, um, who 
who spent a good amount of time actually have a degree in it. I don't have a degree in computer science. Uh, yeah, so, but I have like a theater degree. And I was like, you know what? I did a lot of studying of this guy. For those of you who don't know, this is William Shakespeare. Um, and for also those of you who don't know, he wrote a lot of this. Okay. Now, to put it in perspective, that's a picture of this book, okay, which is approximately 3,500 pages. Of, I don't know exactly what the paper's called, but I call it Bible paper because it's the thinnest stuff in the world. You can see it through like five, or, you know, five pages of it. But this sucker is filled with art. But more importantly, it's filled with expression. And I was like, yeah, that I want to be like that Shakespeare. I was like, yeah, yeah, what can, what can I find out his name, right? He's got a lot of words, I'm going to use those words. In fact, he has 800,000 of them, <laughs> right? This is a rape task that I'm building ran on Shakespeare's text, and it's plotted this out. Actually, we have to dump it all in the subline, and then took a screenshot, that was the biggest waste of time I ever had. <laughs> anyway, look cool, right? But here's what's really cool about it. When we start to draw, you know, tie this into the text, right, and we try and put meaning and purpose on it is, this is what's beautiful. This is where the Ruby, the software engineer that came to mind is this guy. Shakespeare created 1,700 different word forms. He wrote a code. That's what he wrote. That's what he did. He created a whole new language to speak about the beauty of the world around him and the relationships and the things around us. How, how beautiful and vibrant and brilliant is that? I was like, yeah, that guy. I want to make poets, powers. I want to create words like this. Right? I want to do that because that's what I do here. That's what I write this through. That's what I do. So the question becomes, well, okay, you know, let's take a look. Right? Like, <laughs> is that simple? Is that the command? Yeah, you can tell Okay. Cool. I need that CSP. Um, <laughs> right? But, and so it's like, okay, so let's take a look here. Like, what did Shakespeare do? And, uh, and ultimately, it boiled down to, I mean, there were many, many things. Um, and I would love to talk about it. And I realize that there's a lot more to this that's gotten a lot of merit because of the expressional side of it. But, you know, let's just start with a couple of things, right? First, we're going to start with is domain-specific language, right? Domain-specific language. Now, I know what a few of you are thinking, right? I know how this goes. And it's like, not another DSL. Please, don't do that to me, right? I mean, nobody actually wants that. But it's a really important concept. I read I read it. I read a handful of books. One of them is Mark Fowler's book on domain-specific language to try and understand a little bit better about like what are the values, the fundamentals of what that means, and how can we apply it. Like, there's a purpose for it. And I was like, okay, well, if, if this is really true, it's like, no, not more. I don't want any more of that. I was like, okay, okay, okay. Now let's call it something different, right? And ultimately, what I came up with was this: expressive conventions, right? It's like, yeah. I mean, really, that's what we're talking about, right? I mean, if you think about our spec, for example, we're like, describe this, to do this, it does this, expect to be the, right? I mean, we're expressing an intent, we're expressing a convention, we're expressing things. And, and ultimately, what we're trying to do is we're trying to boil it down to something that's consumable and digestible and understandable. And that's really what it is. It's a convention establishes an expectation, ultimately. That's what it is. We're going to use the English language as a syntax. I mean, think of Ruby and all the programming languages out there. It's like, you can't just write them however you want to and just, like, it is okay. I mean, there's syntax errors that they can throw out for God's sake, right? I mean, it's like, you can't do that. So there's domain specific language. There's, there's patterns that exist throughout all of the things we do. And so we're going to redefine this a little bit, okay? Now, if we look at the, dic the uh, dictionary definition of expressive, um, it's kind of like, and you know, I mean, I, I'm, I'm a theater guy, I like this. And it says, it effectively conveys through thought or feeling. Yeah, now we're getting somewhere, right? Spre uh, effectively conveying through thought and feeling, right? Or feeling, or however that is. Is that how you read English? I can't quite <laughs> But I was like, okay, now we're getting somewhere. Like, this is, this is good. Like, this is like, when we're talking about the poetry of what we do, the, art, the artisanship, the craftsmanship of what we do, like, ultimately, what we're doing is we're taking something of ourselves, something so valuable, something that means something, and we're infusing it into the work we do. And it's my belief that when there's a separation between the two, when you're, you're stifled and you're no longer allowed to do such a beautiful thing, that's when we begin to hate it. I think that's when. 
That's when we start to, you know, there's other factors. It's just like, ah, I don't like that anymore. That's horrible. I can't be myself, right? I feel this desire for craftsmanship and, and this drive to deliver something, but I just can't seem to find it, right? I mean, would you agree? Would you agree? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Totally. I mean, I would say that if you didn't believe in your craft, unless your business, your company just said you're going to go to RailsConf and love it or hate it, I don't really care, I don't think you would be here. I mean, am I right? Yeah. Yes. Absolutely. I'm always right. <laughs> so ultimately, it comes down to this, something of, that is meaningful, that is demonstrated, that is suggestive, and is revealing. So there's an argument here that we can really start to infuse this into the stuff we do. And I fundamentally believe that. Now, let's get to, you know, back to some um, conventions that are used. Let's talk about conventions, things that illustrate this sort of stuff. And, you know, we'll, we'll boil that as something we can all relate to. Right? Down means away. Right? I mean, it, it's simple. It's an expressive convention, right? Expressing down means away. Right? I mean, it's the basic stuff we see it through life. I mean, if it's really that simple, I mean, you can teach a dog to do it. Right? I mean, isn't it true? Yes. Isn't it true? Yes. yes. Absolutely. Okay. So here's the beauty of it is that once you establish a pattern, then you have the ability to expound upon that pattern with very little transition, right? So think about it in terms of software development. How, raise your hand if you've ever like um, come on to an existing project where it would be legacy code to you. I mean, look around the room. I don't think anyone's not raising their hand, right? So we've all had this sort of experience where we have to we have to infuse ourselves into our work for a moment, right? You see how smooth I am with that? Just wondering about it. Um, I've been working on it just for this talk. You can diagram Shakespeare's text. Uh, um, and so we have this opportunity to really kind of infuse that into it, ourselves into it, but we run into this issue where we have to discover we have to go through an onboarding phase, right? Or an inception, and ultimately what it tends to be is it tends to be learn our conventions or lack of them. Right, that tends to happen. Right, so it kind of feels like this happened a little bit. Right, and ultimately, I always feel like this when I experience this. <laughs> I mean, right, it's just like, isn't the convention totally clear? And you're like, yeah, totally. <laughs> right means big flush, left means P flush. Like that's you have to learn these things, right? It's not like totally clear, but it's 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 there to some extent. Okay. So, enough of the point is here. It's not gone yet, don't worry. <laughs> and let's actually talk about the strictures. Um, and the strictures might be, you know, we can convert that into something like a design pattern, let's say. I mean, that's kind of a loose way to think about it. Um, how many of you read pretty regularly? Maybe you consider them Apple readers. Great. Now, Here's something that's very common um, that a lot of people I've heard who are avid readers um, find is that they learn to love an author. And I think it's a contributing factor of two different things. One of them is they like the stories, but they like the storytelling, maybe even more so than the story itself. And I think that the storytelling, that aspect of it, the, the conveyance of the idea, the way in which that's done, the mechanisms that are used, that's really the patterns we're talking about, I think. And I think that you can infuse that same sort of conveyance into our software to think about it like that. It's like, if I have somebody else, if I'm going to have a, I love training brand new people on a project. Love it, love it, love it. And the reason is because I love to find the ways in which they're going to interpret the pattern, the conventions that are being used. I think that's just so cool, right? So, so cool. And this is one of the, one of the things that's very common for a lot of poets, especially of, you know, four or five hundred years ago. But it is uh, very much used um, inside of Shakespeare's text, and it's called iambic pentameter. And iambic pentameter stands for, uh, well, what it is is uh, an iam is a block, right? Um, and pentameter represents five in sequence in a meter, right? So uh, it's a rhyming scheme, basically. So if you were to break it down, it would look something like this. Ba-boom, 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 ba-boom. Something like that, okay? Right? And so there's an emphasis on the second syllable is what happens, or at least the second word, right? Um, so let's say we're, we're going to all exercise this. We're all very intelligent people. So what we're going to do is we're just going to do ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. Okay, ready? On count of three. One, two, three. Ba boom, ba boom, ba boom, ba boom. Right? Okay, it's that simple. Did I do four? Did you guys do five? <laughs> <laughs> Did I 
I didn't say I was good at this. So when it breaks it down into an actual line, it looks like this, right? Now here's what's important. The reason why iambic pentameter exists is for kind of two purposes, right? Well, many purposes, but I'm going to point out two. One of them is it actually is very much in alignment with the English language, right? So say a sentence and put the emphasis on the second word, right? So it's like when I do count the clock that tells the time. It, it's very, it's very in alignment with that. Whereas other languages follow a very different meter, right? Now, so the reason why this gets used a lot in poetry for that purpose is that there's a degree of relatability that's kind of baked into the text and into the language. And that's kind of value, right? Again, this is the meter. This is, this is the power of the convention that you utilize. Does that make sense? Right? Yes? Yes. yes. Okay. Now, here's the great thing. Remember, I was talking about it is that once you establish a pattern, you have the ability to send messages through that pattern when you violate or alter the pattern. Here's an example. This is from Hamlet, one of the most famous speeches out there. To be or not to be, pause, that is the question. Now here's the message that's actually getting sent through. Here's actually the breakdown of this, and this is why there's a lot of scholars that like really study Shakespeare, it's because there's hidden messages that are baked into here that help inform the performers and the directors what the meaning and intention was. Let me explain what that is. It puts emphasis on be, not, and be. There's a pause in there. The emphasis on that, right, it's a reference back to to be, which is to live or not to live. That is the question and then on a diminished state. The diminished is actually, it's an 11 beat, right? It's an 11th beat, which indicates if you break it down over the course of the entire to be or not to be, that is the question, whether it is never learn the mind, so the slings and arrows, if you break it all the way into that entire speech, you'll find that the diminished tone at the very end is meant to leave the actor and the audience with the sense that he is uncertain. That's the purpose of it, right? If you read through the text, there's an immense amount of this crazy usage where he'll, he'll pull the tenth off and he'll just leave it on the ninth, right? And it gives a sense of expediency, right? So there's patterns, this is convention, that's all that's done here, right? It's baked into the language. These are the messages that we can send. Not just, we're not just talking about messages between objects. No, 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 we're talking about messages between people, humans, right? And what that means and how that sets up. And if we break this down and look at the, the various conventions that are used, we can see this done already in print. So here's a very simple example, right? I mean, we've got that, right? What's the expectation? Local belongs to return. In the belongs to association, what is it going to return? What's that object? Is it going to be an object? What's it going to be? It's going to be a singular at some point, right? Whereas, as many is going to return what? A, a collection, right? It's not exactly the right, but it's a collection of some kind, right? This is just basic convention. So when you dive into the framework and you're building with this application layer, I mean, you've got conventions that are baked into it that are established for you, and all you do is follow them, right? And, and by following them, it helps inform you. Oh, yeah, I don't have to. I don't have to look through the source to know how to implement this all the time. It's okay, I can kind of forget, and that's sort of all right. And it kind of continues its way across, right? Uh, there's some, you know, some argument against this, but I, I believe this. That, you know, the app-specific app, app code sits in the app, and then the non-specific sits in the lib. And we can kind of see it elsewhere, right? This sort of convention of where, and this DSL that Errol is providing, right? I mean, this is all convention, this is all layered. It's very exciting, right? Well, does that all right? Or we look at this example, right? I mean, again, just more convention, right? This is all like to communicate that there's intent, right? What happens in the first example of user create? What does it return if nothing? Right? It just returns false, right? Right? Whereas the second one down the list returns what? It raises an exception, right? Okay? All right, so, enough of that. It's time for that, people. Okay, go and stand up. All right. All right. So here's what I want to do. All right. I'm going to need four. One, two, three, four volunteers. One, two, three, and four. All right. The four of you come up. All right. Give me a hand. Okay. Say your name. Speak into my chest. Sophie. Liz. Liz. Julian. Julian and? Now here's the beautiful thing. If you didn't know this, thank you, ye, ye four. 
Yes. Uh, if you didn't know this, um, at, in Shakespeare's time, all, well, for the most part, all roles were performed by men, even the women's roles. So, we're going to embrace this fully and say that all roles can be performed by men or women. Yay! All right, so, if you haven't picked this up, we're going to do some acting. Yeah! All right, okay, everybody take a seat. Okay. Oh, so for you, we have this. Okay. That's for you. Okay, that's for you. Okay, and you're going to need to come out here and stand. If you can, you can muster, stand right about there. Okay, and then you get pantaloons. Yeah, and a vest. Okay. All right. And then, Mr. Sir, you get the green velvet. Right? Okay? There you are, fine, sir. And then last but not least, you get a hat. Yes. And a really scarf thing. Okay. All right, excellent. These are my actors. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, gentlemen, all come out to the front. Uh, how do you put those on? Uh, do you need a chair? It's a little confusing. It's all right. It was too much easier this time. Okay. All right, so here's how this is going to work. I'm going to now hand you your sides performers. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to tell you another cool thing. Let's hope this isn't cause issues. Um, another cool thing is that, you know, there were printing presses and stuff that would just use widely across the board. So oftentimes what would happen um, is that they would hand out what are called foul papers. And a foul paper is literally a handwritten document with just one side on it, right? It was like, imagine like scribble, 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 scribble. Right, so that's not necessarily what these are, because I have old sides on here for your benefit. Um, but at Shakespeare, in Shakespeare's time, they would only receive one. Now, because of that, yes, a podium. Okay, uh, kind of. Um, so, so, um, so what would happen is, and this is part of the challenge of compiling all this text paper, was that you would end up with a situation where they just had papers. You know, just everywhere, right? And they were trying to like, compile them down later and create the actual completed works, right? So if you didn't know this, there's different, over time, there were different versions that were, that were uh, created, and as a result, when certain pages were missing, sometimes whoever was compiling that would make it up. And so there's a lot of times in which they would then find the papers and insert them again back into the text, right? So, that's for you, fine sir. You will be Gregory. This is for you, fine sir, you will be Samson. This is you, for you, soon to be sir, uh, you will be Abraham. And this is for you, um, soon to be sir, uh, you will be Benvolio at the very end. Okay? All right. So here's what I want you to do. Okay, all I want you to do is just say your lines. Okay, you're just going to say your lines, but give it attention. Okay, so here's how this works. This is what they did in Shakespeare's time. I did a lot of research on this. Anytime, anytime you were going to fight, you would do this. Anytime. <laughs> 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 Anytime you made any stoic speech, so anything more than two lines, you were required to do this. You know, you're like, yes. Do it every yeah. Stoic speech, stoic speech, stoic speech. Okay. And stoic speech is a little longer, two lines. We're going to say two. Okay? And then anytime you were really pissed, you'd stop your foot. Right? That's right. Okay, very good. Simple enough, right? You're now actors. Okay, one more time, another hand. And now, and the other thing is, they teach us an action. You, you talk to the very back of the room, right? You have to project, talk to the very back of the room. Doesn't mean yell, it means project. Okay, so everybody needs to hear you. Okay, now you're the groundlings, so I want you to react. Can you react? Yes! Absolutely, we are reacting like groundlings. So you want to react to the words that you hear. Yes? Yes! yes. Very good, okay. Begin it, fair Gregory. Tis well, thou art not fish. If thou hadst, thou hadst been poor John. Draw thy tool. Yes! Draw the tool the house of Montagus. Montague, but I'm supposed to do My naked weapon is out. Quarrel. <laughs> Very good. That's a sword, by the way. A naked weapon is a sword. A sword by the way. sword by the Just make sure, yes. For anybody watching, it's a sword. Alright. Alright. Turn thy back and run? Fear me not. <laughs> no, Mary, I fear thee. Let us take the law of our sides. Let them begin. I will frown as I pass by, and let them take it as they list. Oh, Nay, as they dare, 
I will bite my thumb at them, which is a disgrace to them if they were. Do you bite your thumb at us, sir? Which means fuck you. <laughs> I do bite my thumb, sir. Do you bite your thumb at us, sir? No, sir, I do bite my thumb. I do not bite my thumb at you, sir, but I bite my thumb, sir. Quarrel, <laughs> oh, sir. Quarrel, sir. No, sir. If you dare to do, sir, I am for you. I serve as good a man as you. No better. Well, sir. Say better. Here comes one of my master's kinsmen. Yes. And you have been Yes, better, sir. It's yes. <laughs> Oh. Draw, if you be men, Gregory. Remember thy swashing blow. <laughs> Art fools, put up your words. You know not what you do. <laughs> is that it? <laughs> oh, and then there's a tibble. Uh, which is this one? Tibble says, What? Are thou drawn amongst these heartless hinds? Turn thee, Benvolio, look upon thy death. <laughs> I do, but keep the pace. Put up your my sword, or manage it to part these men with me. What? Draw them? And talk of peace? I hate the word, because I hate all hell, all Montagues and thee. Have it thee, coward? They fight. Something along this line, right? 
where you're starting to think in how to call and relay the expectations, right? That we're starting to observe other things, and as a result of those observations, you're starting to tie these objects together, but in a way where the objects are not sort of, they're not controlling the reactions of one another, but there's an interface for them to illustrate that point. Right? And so I think this is something that we can really kind of understand a little bit more so. Now the next point that I want to kind of point, point out, um, and the big, and another kind of big key lesson here is the harmony, right? So this, when we think, if, we, if this was an application here, 800,000 words, right, 100 lines, like a million lines of code is a lot more words than this, right? When you think about it like this, it's a very daunting thing. Right? We look at this and we're like, whoa! Oh. When we enter a code base that's like, you know, the Git, uh, the Git history is humongous and, you know, the entire repository is many, many megs, like, we get into this situation where we're like, oh, I can't understand. And I think the important message is that if we break it down to very small interactions and understand the reasons of those interactions, then it's much easier for us to understand the harmony that emerges out of that example, right? So here's what I'm going to want to do. Um, we're going to do our best to do this. We need to be very sensitive with the cables. Um, this is a land of making forgiveness, not permission. OK, so what we're going to do is I'm going to take and I'm going to stack a grouping of these chairs. And I'm going to clear an area right here. Be very cognizant of the cables. Do it now. Go, 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 go. Yeah. Just, just clear an area of the, of the chairs, just in this section right here. Very good, very good, very good. Okay, and once it's kind of cleared out of the way, I'm going to need 20 volunteers. 20. Don't worry, we're going to see the rules. That looks not good. Okay, we'll just clear that out of the way. Okay, very good. Okay, so the rest of you, you're going to need to stand on your chairs and do it safely if you can. If you can, um, totally understandable. We'll scooch around the outside maybe and see if you can kind of get the example. There's going to be some stuff that's happening over there. Okay, so I am going to need 20 volunteers, 1 through 20, just come into a group right here. You're not going to do any active, don't worry, it's okay. Okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 20, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, uh, something like that. And I want you to form a circle, a big circle. All right, very good. Everybody pay very close attention. I have a ball. Yay! So here's how this is going to work, okay? All I'm going to do is I'm going to hand somebody the ball. Now the rules of the game, not slice game, but activity, are as such. You can't hold on to the ball, okay? You can't pass the ball back to the person that passed it to you, and you, can't, and you have to pass it more than one, right? So I can't do this. You, right? Does that make sense? Simple, simple premise, right? And I'm going to add this ball, and that's, it's that simple. Just pass it around. You can't hold onto it. You have to immediately pass it on. You can't pass it back, and you can't pass it next to you. Yes? Okay, ready? It's that simple. Go ahead, keep going. And there's another one. And another one.
There you go. Perfect. Okay, now you four remember yourself, so you go step aside. Come on, four. Okay, another group of three. How many might I do? Three, seven, ten. Very good. And go ahead. Very good. Okay, now remember you three. Now step aside. What's the other one I'm missing? There's a very good a golf ball. Okay. Do not throw that at me. Okay. Okay, one, uh, I had 20 people, but that was only, okay, very good, now three, and I want you to roll them across the ground to each other. That's it. That's simple. And remember the three of you, okay, go ahead and step aside. Do I, are there any other, ball, any other balls? Who does not, who has not passed the ball around yet? One, two, three, and four. The blue one behind the stage. The blue one. Next to the Okay. Bye. Oh. Okay. All right, so the last four, here's this ball. There you go. And, go ahead. All right. Simple enough. Okay, very good. Now, go uh, off to your areas and remember which ball was tossed to you, okay? Now, here's what I want you to do. We're going to try this, and all I want you to do, okay, is we're going to start with this ball here, and I want you to do the exact same exercise. Pass it only to the people that were in your group. Does everybody remember who was in your group? Oh, wow. Yes. <laughs> Here we go. <laughs> okay, do you remember the color of ball? Okay, there we go. So here's a, here's a way to do this, okay, is only focus on the ball that you are going to be passed or would get passed, right? Wait, would be passed or would be passed. Do not focus on the other balls, okay? Make sense? Okay, we're going to see if we can do this. And you can do this slowly. And I saw some of you do this. You don't have to bounce it. Just, just take it and pass it. Take it and pass it. Okay? Let's see if we can do this. If you have the golf ball, roll it. If not, find a pattern. Okay? So, go through it. Okay, ready? And on the count of three, we're doing that. Okay? Okay. I don't know. Is that... Okay? If your pattern collides, find another pattern. All you need to focus on is the ball that you that you are responsible for. That's it. Don't focus on the other balls. Okay, and pause there. Okay, give me a round of applause. the message, and the message is that there are messages, right? That if you're, app if you're building your applications where you have a scenario where you're not, you're not understanding the simplicity that layers together and ultimately creates the terminal, then you run into this real big collision of state, right? And I think that's ultimately what gets discussed a lot. So if you think about, like, what are the very simple lines of communication that are occurring? And build your objects and your software so that you're, they're focused on very simple lines of communication, then the harmony will emerge. Now, here's the thing that happens, and it happens every time when this exercise is done, is the balls start hitting one another. So what do you do? What is that a representation of? Callbacks. <laughs> it's a representation of callbacks. <laughs> on the rails 14. All right. Now we got it. It's done. Right? So what happens is you have to adjust. Right? So you're going to have a collision, and so what do you do? You adjust. And this is the modification, the iteration that your applications will go through, and that's okay. But focus on the simple lines of communication. Simple lines of communication. And your software is going to be beautiful, and it can grow to millions and millions of lines of code in harmony. All right, very good. Okay, uh, if you're in the middle, sit on the floor. Okay. All right. One more round of applause! The very last things that I'm going to leave with you guys with is, is these couple of things, and that's this. I believe fundamentally um, that we all have a great opportunity as artisans, as craftsmen, craftspeople, excuse me, that um, we can create spectacle. So what does that mean? Well, I don't entirely know, but I do know, I do know it when I see it. So think about that. Like, as a poet of software, as a poet of the code, as this being your art form, this being the pen and the paper, like, think about how you want to leave the spectacle behind, right? Maybe, you're, maybe the spectacle you want to leave is in error handling. Maybe it's in the actual, like, 
uh, you know, the, the public interface or the performance aspect or security, but create a spectacle, create something that's just awe-inspiring, right? And I think that's something that's really up to you to decide. Now, of course, in every good talk about the movie, you have to talk about the band, right? And um, this comes from Matt, and it's often, and I truncated it a little bit, so I'm sorry, Matt, sorry about that. Uh, but it's often people focus on the machines. They think by doing this, the machine will run more uh, effectively. But in fact, we need to focus on humans, on how humans care about doing programming. We are the masters, they are the slaves. How will Shakespeare write Ruby? I don't know exactly, but what I do know is this, that he would create poetry. Create poetry. That's what we're here for. That's what this language was created for. And that's what these were our around for, is poetry. <coughs> create something. Be the poet. And, of course, like any good analogy that ends with an emotional tone, we end with a blank page out of pen. We say to ourselves, the book is empty. Write your own story. <laughs> <laughs> So this is ultimately what you can be left with, is write great code. Be the craftsman, be the poet. Love your art. Everything that I showed you today is going to be on the speaker deck. Um, again, as a reminder, I'm online. That's who I am. I am Adam Cuffey, working for Zeal. Um, the last thing that I want to show you is something I'm very proud of that was emerged out of that. So part of our consultancy is that we only work on, we're consultancy, so we only work on uh, billable projects four out of five days, like a lot of companies do. And on the fifth day, everybody's left to be totally self-organizing and create anything they want. And what emerged is something that um, <clears throat> really warms my heart. And it's this. It's very simple, but it means a lot. And that is that they created this very, very basic app that sends stellar high fives to other people on the earth. I mean, how simple is that? But what it means is it's poetry. This is the art form. This is why I think we do what we do, I think. And so that's what it's all about. Um, this is zeal. Uh, this is who we are. This is the experience we provide. And I hope, if nothing else, I amplify greatness today. Thank you guys very much. Thank you.